When you're making changes to code that doesn't have tests, it's almost impossible not to break something. This is why it's important to add tests first so that you can protect the behavior of the system. These types of tests that protect legacy code and are written after the fact are called characterization tests. And in today's video, we're going to look at one way to build these in JavaScript. To do this, we're going to use the gilded rose refactoring kata. The idea with this kata is that we need to add some functionality to our code base, but there are no tests to ensure that we don't break it, and the existing code is very hard to modify. As you can see, this is available in a bunch of different languages. We're going to be using the JS and Mocha version of this. So I've already cloned this repository, and I've done npm install in our Mocha directory here. If we take a quick look at the source code here, we can see that we have an item class and a shop class. The item class is pretty straightforward. We've got a couple of fields on an item. The shop class seems to be where most of the logic is, but it's pretty dense and hard to read. We're doing something to update the quality of these items when we've got a bunch of values in here. So if you're not familiar with this kata, a great way to get familiar with it is to go to the repo and read the Gilded Rose requirements. Essentially, this explains the project. We are building software for a small shop, and we need to be able to update the sell-in value, which denotes the number of days that we have to sell the item, and the quality value, which denotes how valuable an item is. And there's a bunch of rules for this. Now we could look at these rules and try and read the code and make sure that we understand how the code is executing these rules. But I want to look at another way we can add some characterization tests without having to look at these requirements and map them specifically to different parts of the code. Instead, what I want to do is generate a bunch of tests that show me what the current output value for this code is. Here's why this is important. If you have requirements documentation around some code, but the code doesn't have any tests, there's no guarantee that the code exactly fits those requirements. But more important than the written requirements are the inherent requirements of the code. If there's a bug in the code and people are using this software as is, someone might be depending on the behavior of that bug. And so fixing that is actually breaking the software. So what we want to do is just make sure that given the code that we have today, we can write some tests that capture exactly what the output is for the given inputs. Now, the nice thing about this is there's actually a test that we can get started with. So if we open the test file, we see just a basic test here that is actually failing right now, but we can see the setup that we're looking for. We can see we create a new shop and we pass it an array of items. Looks like we're just going to do a single item for now. And then we call update quality, which gets us some new items. And we can look at the name. And more importantly, I think we'll want to look at those other two fields that we see here, the sell in and the quality. So what I want to do is come up with a full set of possible inputs that we might want to give to our item here, where we have a name, a sell in and a quality. And then we'll run update quality and we'll look at what the values we get out are. So let's go ahead and create some values at the top here. First, we're going to have a set of names. If you look at the requirements, you can see that depending on the name of the product in the shop, the behavior of update quality is different. So we're going to want a list of names here. We know we're going to have different values for sell in and quality. And so maybe we can come up with some min and max for those. I guess we don't have to destructure like I'm doing here, but it's a nice syntax I like for creating kind of like a range. OK, so let's look at our code and figure out what these should be. Well, we can see the name pretty easily. We have aged Bree, Backstage Pass, Sulfura's Hand of Ragnaros. Those are the three values that we care about specifically. And then I think if we look at the requirements, we can see that just everything else falls into another bucket. So let me go ahead and copy these names here. And I'm just going to start removing the other code to create an array of the product names that we want to work with here. And then we'll just add one more normal item to the end here. OK, so now let's look at the cell in values in the code here. Notice we're not really trying to read what the code does. We're just looking for places where we compare the possible inputs and we're going to use those to guide our tests. So let me just search for sell in here. Let's see. We have sell in is less than 11. OK, sell in is less than six. We modify sell in here. Here sell in is less than zero. OK, so it looks like the range of values that we care about is something greater than 11 and something less than zero. It's kind of our, our range. So we'll set our min sell into minus one and our max sell into 12. Uh, let's also do the same thing for quality. So let's see, we're checking here. Quality is greater than zero. Quality is less than 50. So immediately that kind of gives us a range, anything between zero and 50. Here's another check for 50, another check for less than 50, uh, another check for greater than zero, and another check for less than 50. Okay, so it looks like zero to 50 is kind of the range we're expecting. So let's go ahead and do negative one to 51. Okay, so now we have a bunch of input values, names, 
sell-in and quality that we can put into an item here and then we want to see what the possible outputs are. So it's time to start writing some loops. We're going to have a, a name for each of our names here. And then inside of this, let's go ahead and loop over our cell in. So there we go. And I'm gonna copy that and nest it and we'll do the same thing for quality here. It's a lot of nested for loops and we wouldn't want something like this maybe in our production code, but this is a great way for us to find all the different permutations of the set of values that we have here. Maybe this is overkill. We're probably gonna have a lot of test cases that are essentially testing the same path in the code, but this is a really fast way for us to quickly get full coverage of the code. Let's go ahead and copy our actual test code down here. Inside our nested loops, we're going to create a shop. And now inside of our item here, we can use name, sell in and quality. And then we can update the quality. And we know we're always going to look at that first item. So the name should never change. But what we can get is output sell in. And that's going to be items zero dot sell in. And we can also get output quality, which will be items at zero dot quality. So now we have these values and this will show us what the current behavior of our system is. So we need to capture these tests. So let's create a tests array here. Down here, we're going to do tests dot push. We'll do tests dot push and we will push in the inputs and outputs that we expect for this particular test. So we've got the name, we've got the cell in that we're using, we've got the quality, and then we need our outputs. So we'll have the output cell in and the output quality. So now we have an array of all of the possible test values that we might want. At the end of our for loop here, I'm going to log that out. So we can just do a simple console.log. Let's do json.stringify and we will stringify this tests array. And then just so we can get an idea, let's do console.log tests.length because I want to see how many tests we're going to have. Great. So now we have some code that will test the existing behavior of our code and give us the expected outputs for some inputs. And we've chosen inputs that cover the full range of behavior as we know it based on the code that we've read and the requirements that we've read. So let's go ahead and run NPM test and see what we get. We get a huge chunk of output here, which maybe doesn't feel particularly useful just yet. That's OK. And notice we're generating close to 3000 tests. So that's a pretty solid bit of coverage there. I'm going to run this again, but I'm going to pipe it into a file called tests.json. Cool. So now let's go ahead and open up that tests.json file and let's clean up some other output that we have here. And if I go ahead and save this, we can see that my editor has actually uh, formatted this JSON for me. So we have almost 21,000 lines of JSON, but these represent all of the tests that we wanna run. So now let's actually convert these into tests. I'm gonna close this file and let's import it in our tests here. Tests equals require. And of note, of course, we can just import a JSON file and we'll get that uh, blob of JSON. So I'm going to comment out our existing uh, test. Maybe I should change the name from should foo to it uh, generates the expected tests. We're not going to run that ever again, really, um, unless we wanted to, for some reason, recreate uh, our tests. But the important thing here is we've captured the values that we expect to be output from this code. So now we can actually modify the code uh, and know that if we actually change functionality, the test will break. But let's create those tests that should break first. So in here, we can create another for loop and we can say for test of tests. And in here, we're going to create our it and actually run the test. Now we need a name for this test. And I think the best name really is going to be expected values for the test. So I'm going to come down here and save myself a bit of typing. I'm going to copy the names that we have and let's go ahead and destructure these. And I'm actually going to create another object here called the description that will just be the same values in an object so that we have keys and values as the name for my it block. I'm just going to do JSON dot stringify and pass it the description. The description will be name, cell in quality, output cell in output quality, and we'll be able to see exactly which test is failing based on the description of the inputs. Okay, so we have our basic test scaffolding here. What should the test do? Well, we want it to do pretty much the same thing we did down here, except instead of just capturing the output, we're going to compare it to the expected output. Let me paste these lines up here and we can probably change this to say, expect and so we'll expect the sell-in to equal 
the output cell in. And we'll do the exact same thing down here. All right, so quick review here. We've imported our tests. We are going to use that to set up our test. And then we're gonna also use the output values there to compare them to the output values that we get. And so now what we should see is we have close to 3000 tests that now pass and describe the behavior that we expect from our system. So let's go ahead and run NPM test and look at that nice and quick. We have almost 3000 tests. And if we scroll back through this, we can see normal item, Sulfuras, Hand of Sulfuras, Hand of Ragnaros. We have our backstage pass for the concert and we have our aged Brie. And all of these tests, we can see exactly what the description of the test is here. If we needed to copy one of these out and run it individually, maybe if we break one, um, we could easily just copy this JSON string here and set up a new test for ourselves. So that's kind of a handy little byproduct of the way we're outputting this as well. All right, let's actually break the tests to see that they actually do fail if the values change. So maybe, uh, let's see, let's just pick something at random here where we have, we're checking that selling is less than six. Let's change that to be less than five. So we're gonna change that by a single digit. We can run NPM test and we can see that we have 49 failing tests. Pretty cool. So now we can know whether or not we're actually changing the behavior of our code. And if I change that back, we can see they're all passing again. So that's a look at one way that we can add characterization tests to our legacy code. Of course, there's a lot of other great material out there on how you can create characterization tests. So if it's something you're interested in, I hope this video is just a jumping off point for you into a whole area of exploration. In the next video, we'll look at how we can refactor this code now that we have these characterization tests in place. So if you don't want to miss that, please subscribe and thanks for watching.